Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, we're gonna plunge right back into um, not the evidence-based recommendations, but anthrax. Um, and Dr. Stevens is here to introduce the anthrax session. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Anthrax Working Group members uh, that are listed here. In particular, I want to note uh, Sharon Fry, who is a new member of the ACIP, and we welcome her to both the ACIP and this meeting, and also to uh, uh, introduce uh, Stacy Hall, who's a new member of this uh, particular working group. They both come with a great deal of experience and background in, in biodefense-related uh, 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 processes and also in, in preparedness. The, uh, uh, the terms of reference for the committee are listed here. Uh, we've had some data presented on new safety studies. Uh, we're going to be focusing on immunogenic immunogenicity, reactogenicity, logistical considerations for administering uh, uh, anthrax vaccine absorbed via the subcutaneous uh, versus the intermuscular route. Uh, for administration as post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP. Uh, and we'll also be talking a bit about uh, AVA plus uh, PGPG, which is a new uh, uh, adjuvanted uh, 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 vaccine for, for anthrax, uh, and it's used as post-exposure prophylaxis. We'll review some of the today, so some of the efficacy and immunogenicity data on dose-sparing strategies for, for PEP, doing a mass casualty incident when AVA is a limited resource, and also duration of antimicrobial component of PEP uh, when uh, given in conjunction with AVA. Uh, and I, I've mentioned uh, some of this already, uh, review of, of the data on IM versus sub-Q administration of, uh, for mass vaccination following widespread release of bacillus and thracis spores, AVA dose-sparing strategies uh, when, uh, when demand for vaccine exceeds, exceeds supply, and the duration of antimicrobial component of PEP when given in conjunction with AVA. And to do that, uh, Willie Bauer is going to give the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Am I supposed to pull the slides up? Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, Dr. Stevens just went over what we'll be talking about today, so I'll go ahead and skip this slide. Um, so, but first, I just wanted to go over the uh, current AVA pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis licensed indication for adults uh, 18 to 65 years of age. It is used for pre-exposure prophylaxis in persons at high risk for exposure to anthrax. For this indication, it is given as a three-dose priming series at zero, one, and six months, followed by booster doses at 12 and 18 months, and then annually. All doses for pre-exposure prophylaxis are given by the intramuscular route. It is also licensed for post-exposure prophylaxis in persons who have been potentially exposed to aerosolized bacillus and thracis spores. For this indication, it is given in a three-dose series at zero, two, and four weeks by the subcutaneous route. Antimicrobials are also co-administered for 60 days. Today, we'll, we'll only be talking about post-exposure prophylaxis use of AVA, but I thought it was important to mention the route of pre-exposure uh, administration for context. At the last ACIP committee meeting, we presented the Anthrax Working Group's uh, discussion and advice on route of administration of AVA for post-exposure prophylaxis during a public health emergency. The committee suggested that the logistical uh, challenges of a mass uh, vaccination campaign with AVA warranted further discussion. 
Therefore, today we are presenting additional information gathered and an update of the work group's discussion. First, I would like to briefly review some of the non-logistical issues the work group considered uh, regarding different routes of administration for anthrax vaccine that were discussed at the last meeting. Data from 2001 suggests that adherence to the antimicrobial component of anthrax PAP wanes over time and could be as low as 50% by day 30 of the 60-day antimicrobial PAP uh, recommendations. However, we believe this estimate might be low for the following reasons. First, individuals began PEP after the uh, weeks after the initial exposure at a time when much of the risk had already passed. And second, the results were not stratified by level of risk of the different groups. We are now better prepared uh, for a public health emergency. We expect um, PEP will be initiated sooner and public health messaging focusing on the benefits of PEP adherence is expected to result in higher adherence in the exposed populations, particularly those at highest risk. There's also higher rates of adverse events for the subcutaneous uh, compared to the intramuscular route of administration. Although higher adverse, uh, although higher adverse events could uh, uh, discourage adherence, dropout rates did not appear to vary in healthy adults who received AVA by either the IM or subcutaneous route of administration. Here are some of the operational concerns related to a mass uh, anthrax vaccination campaign. These issues prompted CDC to ask ACIP for advice on the route of administration. Subcutaneous vaccinations are usually given with a 5 8 inch needle with, for uh, um, intramuscular vaccinations uh, or, and while intramuscular vaccinations are given with either a 1 or 1 and a half inch needle. In a large event, CDC's supply of 5 8 inch needles might be insufficient to administer vaccine by the subcutaneous route. Commercial supplies may also be insufficient to fill the need in the short term. Uh, CDC also stockpiles one inch needles for IM vaccination administration. In a large event, it may be necessary to use both 5 8 inch and one inch needles, uh, thus, to, uh, thus both IM and sub Q routes of administration may actually need to be used. New Thrax, is the next generation human anthrax vaccine, which is currently in phase two trials. Nuthrax is expected to be licensed for IM administration only. CDC's strategic national stockpile will start transitioning to Nuthrax in 2018 for use under an emergency use authorization while the company seeks licensure. As a reminder, AVA for post-exposure prophylaxis is currently licensed for administration by the subcutaneous route in adults. During transition from AVA to new thrax, which is expected to occur over four to five years, a stockpile will have two vaccines with two different routes of administration for the same indication and thus may be, uh, there may be confusion over which route of administration to use. Additionally, the IND that allows for AVA to be used in children ages six months to 18 years uh, specifies uh, IM administration. This too could make it difficult to ensure that the uh, specific route uh, of administration is used for the uh, specific target population. This uh, situation may lead to administration errors with both vaccines. In order to administer vaccine to a large number of people in a mass casualty event, we need the most efficient method available. This most, vac most routine vaccines are given by the intramuscular route and healthcare providers are more accustomed to giving IM injections. Because there is more experience in the healthcare community giving intramuscular injections, this route may be more efficient for 
uh, quickly vaccinating large numbers of individuals. We presented this data at last uh, committee meeting, so I will quickly go through it as a refresher. This is a Koberger method for bridging animal and human data to determine correlates of protection and the model the FDA recommends for predicting survival. The non-human primates were given AVA at zero, one, and six months. On this graph, the x-axis shows concentrations of anti-PA antibody levels at the time, just prior to challenge with anthrax at 12, 30, and 52 months. The non-human primate survivors are represented by black circles at the top of the graph, and non-survivors are uh, represented by the uh, white circles at the bottom. Then we plot a logistic regression curve of uh, predicted survival. Uh, probability of survival is on the y-axis based on the non-human primate anti-PA IgG measurements. The blue triangles are human anti-PA IgG concentrations at 42 months after receiving AVA at zero, one, and six months. Now, by plotting the individual probabilities of survival and taking the average, we get the mean survival for the population. In this example, the probability of survival at 42 months after receiving AVA at uh, 0, 1, and 6 months is 86.8%. Now, to understand the onset of protection for AVA vaccination when used as uh, or for uh, post Exposure prophylaxis, a study was designed to assess protection after a high dose challenge at day 28 in non human primates that had received subcutaneous AVA at 0 and 14 days. As mentioned a moment ago, to determine a correlate of protection in humans, logistic regression was used to plot a survival curve based on immunological response and survival in the non human primates. These data were then used to predict probability of survival in humans receiving AVA by intramuscular or subcutaneous route. Later in the talk, these data will be used to predict survival for PEP uh, dose sparing vaccine schedules and also to inform uh, discussions about uh, duration of antimicrobial component of PEP when used in, the, in conjunction with vaccine. Here we show the study design to generate the data for the non-human primate immunological results and survival to challenge. The uh, non-human primates were given AVA at days 0 and 14 in doses ranging from one-third to 143rd of the normal human dose. On day 28, they received a, a high-dose challenge of aerosolized uh, bacillus and thracis spores. The human immu immunological response was generated by, vac by giving vaccine to healthy adult volunteers with um, full doses on days 0, 14, 0, 28, or 0, 14, and 28, which is the currently licensed schedule, or with a half dose on days 0, 14, and 28. This graph displays, displays the estimated probability of survival logistic regression curve fitted to the anti-PA IgG concentration data at day 28 just prior to the anthrax challenge. The model predicts a greater than 80% survival of uh, survival for anti-PA IgG antibody levels greater than 6.2 micrograms per ml. You can see from the data that having a detectable antibody level was quite protective. There was only one animal that had a detectable antibody level that, that died. This animal developed anthrax meningitis. This is not unexpected because we know that uh, antibodies cross the blood-brain barrier more slowly, so to, despite having a high antibody titer, the antibodies might not have prevented development meningitis and death in this animal. 
using the survival curves I just showed, the predicted human survival at 28 days following receipt of AVA at days 0 and 14 is, um, is 88.6. If the vaccine is given by the IM route and 92.4 if given by the subcutaneous route. This difference is statistically uh, significant. After receipt of the last priming dose at day 28, the predicted survival is 95.6% for the IM route and 96.1% for the subcutaneous route. This is a non-significant difference. At the last ACIP meeting, I presented this slide. After reviewing the adherence data for both the antimicrobial and vaccine component of PEP and the logistical considerations in an anthrax mass vaccination campaign, the work group did not favor recommending the intramuscular route of administration as an alternative. The work group reasoned that all needle links contained in the CDC stockpile could be used to administer AVA by the subcutaneous route and that the different needle links would not impede vaccine administration. The work group did not believe that intramuscular administration was necessarily more efficient than subcutaneous administration of the vaccine. Although the higher rates of adverse events for the subcutaneous route of administration was a theoretical concern, there was no observable difference in adherence rates for the two routes of administration used in volunteers who participated in a study looking at adverse events with AVA given by different routes of administration. Most importantly, the work group uh, continued to favor the sub-Q route as the only route of administration because of the immune response to AVA at, w at four weeks is significantly higher for the sub-Q route of administration compared to the IM route. A faster, higher immune response was deemed the most important factor because of consistent trends for anthrax, other chronic diseases, and clinical experience, which all suggest that adherence to antimicrobials as a component of anthrax PEP wanes over time. To gather more input on the logistical challenges for the anthrax vaccine mass vaccination campaign, we uh, approached two groups on the front lines of preparedness efforts at the uh, local level, uh, NACHO and ASTO. The National Association for County and City Health Officers Medical Countermeasures Work Group addresses issues related to the provision of medical countermeasures for the treatment or prophylaxis in, accord in accordance with public health guidance. The Association of State and Territorial Officers, all 62 MCM coordinators, collectively addresses the implementation challenges associated with planning, distribution, and dispensing medical countermeasures during a public health emergency by providing CDC with information, feedback, and recommendations. We asked these two groups to provide input on how they thought having vaccines with two different routes of administration and different routes of administration for different target populations could potentially affect efficacy of the response and the number of people vaccinated in a timely manner. Okay, the views were not unanimous, but the consensus for both, for these two groups uh, was that administrating vaccine by two routes would adversely impact uh, response efficiency. This summarizes some of the main challenges foreseen with uh, having to incorporate two different vaccines with different routes of administration. They noted that those who have more serious adverse events or who hear of people who had more serious reactions are less likely to return for subsequent doses. The individual representing New York City noted that in an anthrax uh, post-exposure prophylaxis response following exposures to African drum skins, not all potentially exposed individuals return for subsequent vaccination doses precisely due to the adverse reactions following subcutaneous administration. 
a number of voice concerns that an increase in medical errors would likely occur with multiple routes of administration requiring uh, requirements for various reporting of medical error errors could slow the response. There was also concern this might increase legal, ethical, and public relation issues. The state and local health preparedness, uh, emergency preparedness partners believe there would be resistance to the use of needle links not commonly used for routes of administration. They also foresaw logistical challenges associated with matching needles and vaccine supplies at large numbers of points of distribution sites. Training was mentioned by several as a important consideration for a mass vaccination campaign. In a mass vaccination campaign, uh, medical providers with little to no training and vaccination techniques may be recruited to provide vaccination. Our state and local partners felt that IM administration is easier for vaccination or for vaccine providers to learn and that providing just-in-time training on two different modes of administration would slow the response. In addition, some suggested that it might require providers to learn only one uh, of the two techniques, thus doubling the number of staff required. Given these concerns by the uh, public health emergency preparedness community, the work group mo modified their earlier advice. The work group still maintains that subcutaneous route of administration should be used in both adults and children whenever possible. However, in a large scale emergency event, these populations should receive AVA by the route that results in the most efficient vaccine vaccination campaign. Thus, AVA for PEP may be administered using an intramuscular route of administration uh, if the subcutaneous route of administration poses a significant material, personnel, or clinical challenge that may delay or preclude vaccination. The working group also felt it would be access acceptable for individuals to receive the vaccine by the intramuscular route if they had experienced significant adverse events from AVA administered by the subcutaneous route. So I would like to ask now if the ACIP committee has any questions or concerns with this data and if there are any other data the committee would like to see. Thank you. Questions, thoughts? Okay, then yes, we'll keep on, going. on to the next. So now we will move on to um, dose sparing strategies when demand for vaccine exceeds supply. Okay. This is a graph I showed earlier that uses a, log a logistic regression curve to predict survival fitted to the anti-PA IgG concentration data at day 28 just prior to anthrax challenge following AVA receipt uh, at day 0 and 14. Again, the study designed to generate the data for this for the non-human primate immunological response and and survival to challenge with anthrax. The um, non-human primates were given varying doses of the normal human dose of AVA on day zero and 14, and on day 28, they received a high dose challenge of aerosolized bacillus and thracis spores. The human immunological response was generated by looking at three dose sparing regiments, arms A, B, and D, and the licensed PEP schedule RMC. This graph shows the human anti-IgG concentration over time with the various dose sparing schedules and the currently licensed schedule in the purple line. The dashed line represents the 80% protection level determined from the correlates of protection model. This vertical line is at day 28 when individuals receive the uh, 
license schedule or the uh, proposed uh, dose sparing schedules uh, receive the last dose except for zero and 14 day dose sparing schedule. This line is day 42. This line is at day 42, is two weeks after the last dose of all the uh, schedules uh, that end on day 28, and is at and and is at four weeks after the end of uh, end of the day zero and 14 uh, dose sparing schedule. This is the same data, but uses the TNA ED50 assay rather than the uh, anti-PA IgG concentration. It shows the same pattern as we saw in the previous slide. All dosing schedules are predicted uh, to be highly predictive by day 28, except for the zero and 28 day schedule, since they have only gotten one dose um, at uh, up to that time point. These data show us that all the schedules with a dose at day 14 produce high levels of protection by day 28. The one schedule lacking a day 14 dose produced the highest levels from day 42 onward. As you might expect, the full three doses produced higher antibody levels than the um, half dose schedules. The peak antibody response occurred two weeks after the last dose for all regiments and all were highly protective. This table summarizes the high levels of predicted survival two weeks after the last dose using the various dose sparing schedules and the currently licensed schedule. Note that the animal trials used a high dose challenge at day 28 with no antimicrobials, whereas humans in a exposure scenario would only have residual spores four to six weeks after the initial uh, exposure and concurrent antimicrobial use. So this is considered to be an extremely conservative worst case estimate. The working group agreed that all dose sparing schedules provided high levels of estimated protection two weeks after the last dose and that the protection was only slightly less than the estimated protection provided by the uh, license schedule. Thus, it seemed reasonable that in an actual or impending vaccine shortage, the benefits of providing protection to a large number of individuals outweighed the risk of slightly lower uh, protective levels. The working group realized that the logistics of mass vaccination campaign following a wide area release of bacillus and thracis spores could make receiving the vaccine exactly at two week intervals difficult and thus considered a range of zero and two to four weeks for the two dose sparing schedule. The working group agreed that if the demand for vaccine exceeds supply, that dose sparing strategies could provide greater protection to exposed population as a whole, while only slightly lowering the protection provided to some individuals exposed to um, anthrax. The consensus among the working group was that both the two full doses given at zero and two to four weeks and the three half doses given at zero, two, and four weeks were acceptable dose sparing strategies and provided a high level of protection by two weeks after the last dose. The selection of the dose sparing strategy to implement depends on the anticipated shortage. The two, dose, the, the two full dose strategy will expand the vaccine supply by 50% and the three half dose strategies will expand it by 100%. The working group also felt, uh, the, the working group also wanted to add a statement to the guidelines stressing the importance of adherence to the antimicrobial component of PEP. 
this statement would describe the components of PEP that antimicrobials prevent anthrax if taken as prescribed and a rationale behind the two components of, of anthrax uh, PEP with, re with emphasis that for anthrax PEP to work, the antimicrobial component must be adhered to for a minimum of two weeks after the last dose of vaccine PEP. So now I would like to see if the um, ACIP committee had any questions or concerns with this data, and if there's any other data the committee would like to see on this subject. But, yes, Nancy. Yeah, um, I just want to make sure I, I understand in a question. Um, if in the event of a large event, vaccine was going to be given either um, uh, intermuscularly, which is off-label, or um, because of the size of the event, there was a need to use one of these dose-bearing regimens, presumably that would be given under an EUA? That yes, I, I, right, this would be off-label. So yes, the dose-bearing schedules would be under an EUA or maybe an EUI. Yes, clearly we would only use these dose-bearing schedules if there was evidence that more people were exposed and going to need PAP than we had vaccine. I, I, you, you may remember that I pre presented uh, before some scenarios of large events, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's unlikely to happen, but if there was a huge event with a lot of people exposed, we could potentially have more exposed people than we have vaccine. And that's the only time that we would consider the dose bearing schedules. Dr. Riley. This is kind of a tangential question, but um, hearkening back to something that um, one of the, um, someone brought up today about behavioral therapy, just out of curiosity, are people more likely to, you know, get the two vaccination or three, whatever the directions are in an event like this where they see serious risk immediately? Is there any data to know how people will react? Because it says you, you commented that, you know, people are unlikely to come back in two week intervals or three week intervals. I guess my question is, are people more likely to actually follow the directions in a situation like this than they are for, you know, routine vaccination? You know, I don't know of any data, so this is just, you know, my opinion that I think that in an event, if people, you know, saw people in the hospital with anthrax and you said this vaccine will help, will potentially protect you, they would get it. Now, when you get onto the internet and start hearing people talk about, you know, vaccines and stuff, then and 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 then they start thinking about their own level of risk. I think what really drives people to get the vaccine is what they perceive their level of risk is. So we need to do a good job of telling people in an exposed area that we really believe that they need to get the vaccine. Yes, back to the messaging. Dr. Hunter. So I've got a comment and then a question to follow up uh, your statement about um, taking antibiotics for at least two weeks after the last vaccination. So my comment is that I've uh, participated as a, played the role of medical director in a, in a simulation of a, uh, exposure on a campus for anthrax and got to decide whether or not the lay actor people got to go to the emergency room or if they had an allergy, what alternative medications they took. So um, it's a very interesting situation to actually have done the simulation in. And then I also did an occupational follow-up of um, brucella exposure in a lab of a group of, I think it was somewhere between six and 12 people who may have had exposure. And they have to take a similar uh, length of uh, antibiotics and similar side effects of the antibiotics they have to take. And it was amazing how few people really wanted to follow up with that. Because these antibiotics have a lot of side effects and people are always thinking about Am I, was I really at risk? Did I really have exposure to this or not? So I think this is a real issue um, from my anecdotal experience. So um, 
that brings me to, if you get to the first, whatever is your last dose of, anim, of uh, uh, your vaccine, are you going to tell the, the person that gets their last dose of the vaccine that, oh, you only have to take it for two more weeks, or are you going to tell them you really have to take it for uh, the whole 60 days? Well, that, that, that will go on to our next uh, discussion about uh, duration of, um, of uh, antimicrobials. But th this was just, you know, talking about the dose sparing. So you know, if you all decided that you, if you all look at the data and decide that you uh, don't think that we could maybe lessen the length of antimicrobials, then yes, I would say that even with these um, dose sparing regimens, we would still continue uh, recommending 60 days of antimicrobials. I guess a follow up to that is, uh, was there any discussion, you're, you're on the committee, right? Was there any discussion um, about, are you thinking that there would be any situation where you would rely on the reduction in the amount of antibiotics you'd have to use because of using um, vaccine and you could shorten the, the dose so that you could have more people take um, the antibiotics appropriately? You, you know what I'm saying. It's sort of not a, not a dose reduction of the uh, vaccine, but a dose reduction of the antibiotics. Are you asking about antibiotics? So you're asking in a situation if there was insufficient antibiotics to vaccinate, I'm sorry, insufficient antibiotics to give everybody in the exposed population antibiotics. It right. Might be helpful it, it, to go on to the next. But there was no discussion on that side. But I, I think if I understood, I mean, if, if you didn't have enough vaccine, then yes, 60 days of antimicrobials would protect you from the initial releases. You also like the, the, the thought of the, the vaccine also protects you from subsequent re aerosolizations as well. I think your question is if there was insufficient antibiotic supply. And what I would say in general, in most of the scenarios that Willie's group has been working on, the supply constraint is really much more narrowly around vaccines. Oh, since yeah. Antibiotics are more widely available. And so they're yeah. not really considering a scenario where you have more vaccine than antibiotics, because that probably isn't realistic. Yeah, yeah the, the, right. Antibiotics are, are fairly inexpensive. We have a lot of antibiotic stockpile. <laughs> okay, so um, th this will be fairly short because a lot of the, the data is going to refer back to uh, uh, the, the studies that I showed previously, but now we're going to talk about duration of antimicrobial component of PAP when used in combination with anthrax vaccine. So <clears throat> the same data was used to look at Dose sparing strategies was the basis for uh, discussion on um, duration of antimicrobials in conjunction with vaccines. So I'm not going to show the study uh, design or graphs again, but I will point out some of the important findings. For for most of the dose sparing strategies, as well as a licensed schedule, 42 days is two weeks after the last dose. For the 0 14 dose sparing schedule day 28 is two weeks after the um, last dose. The peak response occurs around two weeks after the last dose of the uh, current, uh, currently licensed vaccine and all the dose sparing schedules. The peak response in all the schedules are, are um, highly protective. This slide shows the estimated protection at day 28, 42, and 63 for the dose sparing schedules and the licensed schedule. Peak protections for all vaccines occurred two weeks after the last dose and high protection is maintained through day 60 when the antimicrobial component of PEP is currently recommended to end. The data demonstrates high levels of protection in non-human primate models and high predicted uh, probability of survival in humans two weeks after the second dose of vaccine. 
discontinuation of the antimicrobial component of PEP once peak immune response is reached would shorten the antimicrobial requirements and potentially reduce adverse events related to continued antimicrobial use. Shortening the duration of the antimicrobial component of PEP might improve adherence. The work group felt that the antimicrobial component of PEP could be discontinued at 42 days after initiation of vaccine if given on schedule for both the licensed and the dose-bearing schedules. However, the second dose of vaccine is critical to producing high antibody titers, so to take in consideration that in an emergency response, the vaccine may not be given exactly on schedule the work group advised that in immunocompetent individuals, antimicrobials should be continued for at least 42 days or two weeks after their last dose of, of the vaccine series, whichever comes last. There was no reason to suggest that giving vaccine would lengthen the need for antimicrobial PAP. The, so the work group saw no need to continue antimicrobials past 60 days, which is a recommended length of antimicrobial PEP when not given in conjunction with vaccine. The above recommendation is for immunocompetent individuals, persons with an immunocompromising condition that might interfere with their ability to develop an adequate immune response should receive antimicrobials for 60 days concurrent with vaccine. The work group also felt it was important to note that once vaccine and antimicrobials are completed, any illness within two weeks should prompt evaluation for anthrax. And if anthrax is suspected, treatment should be with classes of antimicrobials not used for PEP. So now I would like to see if the um, committee has any questions or concerns with this data or if there's any other data they would like to see. Other questions, <coughs> concerns? Chris Hahn, CSTE. Um, looking at those recommendations um, and thinking about, and I know you already spoke with ASTO and NHO about this, so maybe you heard something different, but my thought is everybody gets 60 days. I just feel like it'd be, um, let's say you're doing a campaign and you're they don't go down one line to get their vaccinations, and they go somewhere else to get their antibiotics. It'll be, it'll be a real challenge, I think, to coordinate that, especially if people are getting different doses, or if during your campaign you suddenly go to half dose or a shorter course because you've decided you don't have enough after all, and then oh, wait, which course of antibiotics should these folks go on? I, think, I just think there could be mass confusion, and it just seems simplest to me to have everybody do 60 days of antibiotics. And I'm sure that was discussed, especially since you said there's plenty of antibiotics, if there's not an issue of a shortage. Yeah. Maybe just explain why why that wasn't yeah. the, I, the decision. I mean, I think we would like to get people off antimicrobials as soon as we believe that there's an adequate immune response because there is some risk to taking antimicrobials over a continuous uh, period of time. Uh, and I mean, whether I mean, I, so you're essentially saying that if we have a group of people that say may be immunocompromised and we would recommend that they continue it for 60 days and a group that is not immunocompromised and we could say that they could stop it at 42, that would cause confusion. And I would counter that the people who are going to be, have an immunocompromising condition would be in the vast minority and thus the we're doing a greater good for the population by keeping them off extended any micro or keeping them off any microbials if we are not convinced that they're benefiting from those antimicrobials. Yeah, one one last point um, it might be that some people, as as you have alluded to, are not going to come back for those subsequent doses of vaccine. So if you've got everybody on sixty, you're also protecting those people. Um, and another thought might be down the road when they come back for their second or third dose, that's when they're counseled on, hey, guess what? We told you 60, but we're going to shorten you up because, you know, so that so instead of at the, on day one, you decide ahead of time that they get a shortened course, you could make that a part of the follow-up um, vaccination. When they show up for their sec subsequent doses, that's when you tell them, good news, we get to shorten you up. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, 
I went through that last slide fairly quick, but it was one of our recommendations was that if they did not finish the schedule, the vaccine schedule, whichever one we're talking about, if they didn't finish it, then they should get 60 days. Any other questions for Dr. Bauer? Yes, Dr. Lee. Minor question, just around the immunocompromising conditions. Do you have any sense of which types you might be thinking about? Is it? Yeah, I'd, uh, I would have liked to have been able to like have a list for you all, but we're still working on that. I want to talk with some other colleagues who know uh, more about some of the, the more routinely used vaccines, maybe like hepatitis B, and see what they have come up with for uh, conditions that do not lend themselves to a robust immune response. So both uh, humoral and cellular immunity, um, immune defects would be considered, not either or? Uh, consider immune defects? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, yeah, like I'm, I'm wondering, thinking yeah, about it's, splenectomy, are you think is this an antibody-mediated protection that we're assuming, or is it to be defined? I, actually, I would, right, I, I guess I would like to see if there's any data to see if asplenic people, how they responded to the uh, anthrax vaccine. But yeah, it, I, I mean, that is something that we want to look at to, to see if we could sort of give a, a list of the immunocompromising conditions, including maybe just advanced age. Yes. Dr. Whitley Williams. Had Whitley Williams, uh, NMA. The recommendations for children, we often forget that they also can be exposed during a bioterrorist attack and AVA, is that I, is that approved now, FDA approved no, for it, use in children? It, it is not uh, it is not licensed in children, so if it were used in children, it'd have to be under an IND. But we have been in uh, communications with um, AAP and, and they, uh, since, since there's really no data in, in children, they believe that the risk of anthrax in that in, in the pediatric population is greater than the unknown risk of of adverse events related to the vaccine. So so basically, our recommendations would be that the children and would get these the the same uh, recommendation as adults, but it would just have to be given under an IND. So in a in a um a group situ situation where there are many children involved, the process of obtaining that IND usually goes through an IRB that's local, but would it go through a government IRB? I'm just yeah, pointing it, that in terms of facilitating the use of the vaccine. Right, we, uh, we, we've been working with our state and local partners to make sure that this the, that we could um, pull this off. I mean, we're, we're wanting, the plan is to uh, get antimicrobials in people very quickly and the vaccine within a few days after that. Any more questions? Not, Looks like not, there's one more. a question, just a comment. Sorry. Uh, one is we practice for these type of events at UNC each year. We set up a 24-hour flu uh, clinic, essentially, that runs 24-7, and we immunize anywhere from two to 5,000 people in those 24 hours. It's our practice for these events. And in terms of uh, IRB approval, we have, I co-chair our, our IRB, we have someone on call 24-7. Uh, we can give approval immediately for an emergency IND. And that happens at least once a month for some patient with some drug. Uh, so that can be very fast. Thank you. thank you. Any further questions or comments? If not, thank you very much, Dr. Bauer. Thank you, um, everyone. I think what we will do is we have a break scheduled now um, before the HPV session. Why don't we come back at uh, five of, and we'll start then. I also, before we take a break, I just wanna um, let you all know that we are editing the agenda for tomorrow so that we can um, get some sessions. We, we skipped the evidence-based recommendation session and we'll try to have that available and, uh, and tell you guys what the agenda will be tomorrow before the end of the day.
Okay, welcome back. Um, we're going to start the human papillomavirus vaccine session and Dr. Salaji will introduce this session. Good afternoon, last session. Um, can you advance the slides? Okay, there we go, okay. Today's session will include two parts. First, an update on HPV vaccine safety, focusing on the nine valent HPV vaccine. And second, background and data for consideration of harmonization of the HPV vaccination age recommendations for females and males, particularly the harmonization of the upper age limit. So first, a few words about the nine-valent nine HPV vaccine safety data. Um, this HPV vaccine session at ACIP includes updates on vaccine safety. We've heard um, very few folks post-licensure safety data on a nine-valent HPV vaccine, which is the only HPV vaccine distributed in the United States since late 2016. Since licensure of this nine-valent HPV vaccine in December 2014, 29 million doses have been distributed in the United States. The nine-valent HPV vaccine safety data will come from VAERS, Dr. Jorge Arana, Arana will present that, and also the uh, rapid cycle analysis vaccine safety uh, data link, the VSD, and Dr. Jim Donahue will present that. These data form the initial body of evidence on the post-marketing safety profile of this vaccine. And I would like to remind ACIP that the quadrivalent and the nine-valent HPV vaccines are quite similar. Both are VLP vaccines and manufacturing is similar. The nine-valent HPV vaccine has more adjuvant content and of course, five additional VLPs. There are over 10 years of reassuring and robust safety data for the quadrivalent HPV vaccine. I'd like to thank the Immunization Safety Office at CDC and their colleagues who are responsible for collection and analysis of these data. So that was the first part. The second part of today's session will deal with harmonization of HPV vaccination age recommendations for females and males. And the work group has been discussing this over the past year. The current HPV vaccination recommendation, as you know, is for routine vaccination at age 11 and 12, although it can be started at age nine, and catch up vaccination through age 26 years for females and age 21 years for males. Males age 22 to 26 years may be vaccinated. So the issue being discussed by the work group is harmonization of the upper age at 26 years for both females and males. And presentations will be the Background and Considerations by Dr. Markowitz, Trends in HPV-Associated Cancers by Dr. Elizabeth Van Dyne, and the Epidemiology of HPV in Males by Dr. Anil Chaturvedi, and he'll focus mostly on oral HPV and oral pharyngeal cancers. So I'd like to thank the ACIP HPV Vaccine Workgroup, the other ACIP members, Cindy and Jose, the ex officio members, liaison representative consultants, CD contributors, but most importantly, our fearless leader, Lori Markowitz. And so the first presentation will be by Dr. Jorge Orana on, on VAERS. Good afternoon. I'm Jorge Arana with the Immunization Safety Office, and today I will be providing a safety update of nine valent human papillomavirus vaccine in the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. There are no conflicts or interests to disclose. As a reminder, nine valent HPV vaccine was licensed in the US in 2014. In February 2015, ACAP recommended nine valent as one of the three HPV vaccines that can be used for routine vaccination in the US. By the end of 2016, 
the manufacturer stopped marketing of bivalent and quadrivalent vaccine in the US, leaving only nine valent vaccine available for this country. Approximately 29 million doses of nine valent vaccine have been distributed in the US. This is from December 2014 through December 2017. This slide summarizes the safety profile as described in FDA's regulatory action documentation. Before nine valent was licensed by the FDA, the safety of this vaccine was evaluated in more than 15,000 participants. The results of pre-licensure studies showed nine valent to be generally well tolerated. The safety profile was similar to that of quadrivalent HPV vaccine. However, there was more injection site swelling and erythema after nine valent compared with four valent. Among those inadvertent pregnancies occurring during the clinical studies, the proportion of adverse outcomes observed were consistent with those observed in the general population. There was an imbalance in spontaneous abortion following nine valent during pregnancy compared to quadrivalent. However, these SABs observed were within what is expected for early loss of pregnancy. And rates of SABs in the nine valent group were not elevated compared to background rates. The objective of, of this presentation is to describe the safety profile of reports submitted to VERS after nine valent HPV vaccine. Again, just to remind you, VERS is a spontaneous national vaccine safety monitoring system, and it is run by the CDC and the FDA. Like any passive system, VERS has its strengths and limitations. The strengths are it's a national data, accepts reports from anyone. It allows for rapid signal detection, can detect rare adverse events, and the data is available to the public. Limitations include reporting bias, inconsistent data quality and completeness, and lack of unvaccinated comparison group. And because of these limitations, generally we cannot assess if a vaccine caused an adverse event only using VERS data. VERS is an important signal detection system that can generate hypotheses and help to identify potential vaccine safety concerns that can be studied in more robust data systems. Our surveillance includes US nine valent HPV vaccine reports received from December 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2017. Pregnancy reports were excluded since there is an ongoing separate analysis of pregnancy-related reports after HPV vaccine. The definition of serious is by the Code of Federal Regulations and is defined as a, an, an event resulting in death, life-threatening illness, hospitalization, prolongation of hospitalization, or permanent disability. Signs and symptoms of adverse events on each report were coded using medical dictionary for regulatory activities, preferred terms, or PTs. These PTs are not mutually exclusive, and a single report may be assigned more than one PT. We do an automated analysis of nine valent reports and clinical review of reports of selected conditions of clinical interest. Those that historically have been of interest, such as anaphylaxis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and death. We also review of more recent interest, such as reports such as uh, from complex regional pain syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and primary ovarian insufficiency. Empirica Bayesian data mining is conducted by FDA colleagues and is used to detect disproportional reporting inverse for vaccine adverse events after nine valent and help us to identify adverse events reported more frequently 
than expected after nine valent compared with other vaccines in the whole database. This graph shows the number of reports to VERS following HPV and other adolescent vaccines, meningococcal and Tdap vaccines. What we see here is that in 2006, after HPV quadrivalent was licensed, there is a spike for this uh, vaccine in 20, 2007 and 2008, and then decline. And this is a common phenomenon seen, seen in passive systems like VERS after licensure of a new product. The same phenomenon is noted for 9 valent in 2016 and 2017. This table summarizes inverse database uh, following nine valent for the first three years for licensure. There is a total of 7,244 reports. And for these reports, 31% were females. Note that the sex was unknown in almost half of reports. This is a limitation of the passive system. But overall, serious reports were about 3% and reports of death comprised 0.1% of all reports. In 64% of reports, the source was the manufacturer. Median age was 14 years, and median onset interval was day zero or the day of vaccination. In 75% of reports, nine valent was given alone. I will now show the most frequently reported signs and symptoms. And it's, it is important to focus uh, on the percent, not necessarily on the raw numbers. And as you can see, these local or systemic uh, signs are consistent with what was reported from pre-licensure clinical studies. Dizziness, syncope, and headache were the three most frequent for the non-serious reports, and again, headache, dizziness, and nausea for the serious reports. Now I'm going to provide uh, data of some selected conditions. I will start with uh, conditions that historically we have monitored and reviewed. In our automated data, we identified nine reports of anaphylaxis. After clinical review, three reports were confirmed or met Brighton diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis. Among these confirmed reports, two received nine-valent vaccine alone. The remaining reports did not contain sufficient information. Eight reports of GBS were identified. Four reports met Brighton diagnostic criteria for GBS. Three of these four reports describe a viral respiratory illness two to four weeks prior to presentation of GBS symptoms. The remaining reports did not contain sufficient information to make a determination. Seven dead reports were received. Among these reports, Five were hearsay reports or based on indirect information or information that somebody saw on the internet. Two reports were verified by an autopsy or certificate of death. And the cause of death of these two reports were cardiac arrest and cerebellar aneurysm. We also review conditions of more recent interest or often highlighted through the media. We review potential CRPS reports. Only one report was identified and the information was insufficient, therefore was classified as possible CRPS. We identified uh, 17 possible POTS reports, of which six partially met the clinical diagnostic criteria for POTS. The remaining reports did not contain sufficient information to confirm a diagnosis of POTS no pattern of concern was noted. We identified three reports of possible POI. However, they did not contain sufficient informi information to confirm a POI diagnosis, or those were 
uh, classified as hearsay reports, meaning those were based on indirect information or read on the internet. Data mining by FDA colleagues show disproportional reporting of syncopy. We know that syncopy historically was disproportionately reported for four valent, and syncopy is currently a label adverse event. Other PTs uh, signal but do not represent an adverse event, such as drug administered to patient of inappropriate age and other administration errors. No other disproportional reporting for nine valent has been noted. This slide summarizes our findings. Um, VERS received more than 7,000 reports following nine valent HPV vaccine during the study period, December 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2017. Most of these reports, 97%, were non-serious. Overall, most frequently reported adverse events after nine valent were dizziness, syncope, headache, and injection site reactions. During this time, approximately 29 million doses of nine valent have been distributed in the United States. No new safety signals or unexpected patterns were observed in VERS reports. And the safety profile of nine valent is consistent with data from pre-licensure trials and post-licensure data on quadrivalent. The CDC and the FDA will continue to monitor and evaluate the safety of nine valent vaccine as well as all other vaccines. Uh, we thank to, we wanna thank the colleagues for the Immunization Safety Office at CDC and FDA for the contributions for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we go on to the next presentation and then we'll do questions on both of them if that'd be all right. Thank you, Dr. Arana. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm here today going to present the results of uh, recently completed surveillance that assessed the safety of the nine valent vaccine in the vaccine safety data link. So just a, um, a quick outline um, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, briefly describe the rapid cycle analysis and then get into a description of the surveillance itself um, and the results. And since the surveillance is, the weekly surveillance anyway, is officially completed, we're morphing into a, a different kind of surveillance mobile called maintenance surveillance. It'll take advantage of the programmatic infrastructure uh, that we've established in this RCA and uh, continue surveillance uh, into the future. So the VSD, um, as you all know, is an integrated, is a, is a collaboration between CDC and the integrated healthcare plans, eight of them. And the RCA, though, was developed to permit a more rapid assessment of the vaccine safety using near real-time data. Um, the trade-off is, for, for getting access to the rapid, assess, uh, rapid data, is that the uh, adverse event signals are interpreted as potential associations. And we use additional analyses, additional follow-up, medical record review, so on, to determine whether or not these potential associations are, in fact, true associations. And this is a... It's a this, this surveillance is very similar to the one that was conducted in, um, and published in 2011. It's also an RCA of the quadrivalent vaccine led by Jim G and uh, Allison Nailway. Uh, they documented 600,000 doses and found no statistically significant associations. So the objectives are pretty straightforward in this, um, in this study, and that is to conduct near real-time surveillance over a two-year time, time period to assess the risk of pre-specified adverse events following the receipt of the uh, nine-valent vaccine. 
And also we're gonna use this data to monitor the vaccine usage in BSD over time. So the RCA design is typically a prospective or hybrid type of uh, setup. Uh, the surveillance period for our study was October of 2015 to October 2017. And it included males and females nine to 26 years of age and they had to be enrolled in one of the six participating BSD sites. So I won't go into the recommendations. They were all covered by Dr. Zalagi and um, Dr. Tarana. I will mention that um, uh, there were some, uh, in addition to the antigens that were increased, five more uh, HPV types, there was about double the amount of adjuvant in the nine valent vaccine compared to the quadrivalent, but they both have similar and really good safety profiles based on lots of uh, various studies. So in an RCA, what we typically do is identify uh, adverse events um, that we want, to, what we want to monitor. And the characteristics of these are they have to be clinically well-defined, have an acute onset, so occur fairly rapidly after vaccination. Obviously, have to result in a medical encounter and are biologically plausible, ideally. For our RCA, we included all the adverse events that were monitored in the uh, quadrivalent analysis. Plus, we included injection site reactions because they appeared to be more common among the nine valent group in, in clinical trials compared to the quadrivalent. We also included pancreatitis because that was reported in various following quadrivalent. So on this next slide, we have um, some additional detail about these uh, adverse events. And in, in addition to the adverse events you see on the column on the left, we also have the setting in which they had to occur, so either outpatient ED or inpatient, and the post-vaccination window. So that's the number of, that's the days in which, within which the event had to occur after vaccination. And for syncope, for instance, day zero means it had to occur on the day of the diagnosis. We also have in the far right column there, the primary comparison group, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But the adverse events we looked at for this uh, surveillance was syncope and injection site. We knew those were gonna be fairly common. We also looked at allergic reactions and seizure. And then events that were less common or even rare, uh, anaphylaxis, appendicitis, pancreatitis, GBS, CIDP, stroke, and VTE. So a general RCA approach is that we use, we, we get data every week from all the sites, this is aggregate data, and we do analysis every, every week. And the overall uh, approach is fairly straightforward. We wanna compare the observed counts of adverse events against some expected number or some reference that's generate, uh, some comparison group that generates the, the counts, unexposed comparison group. The trickier part comes in that we are doing these analysis every week we don't want to have a lot of false positives and a lot of false uh, signals. So we do sequential analyses to uh, maintain a predefined type one error rate. And then in each, for each of these adverse events, we also looked at various subgroups defined by age, sex, and dose. So I won't get into too much about the sequential analytic methods used. I can get pretty uh, detailed pretty quickly, but I will say that there were two main types that we used. We used the maximized sequential probability ratio test and a closely related uh, method called the conditional max SPRT. Uh, and the other main method was the exact sequential analysis. Now for the sequential probability, probability ratio test, this is optimal, these methods are optimal for uncommon or rare events like anaphylaxis or GBS. And uh, the background counts or background rates come from two different sources in our, in our study. Um, they're both historical comparison groups, and we, the, core, the group, the um, historical comparison we used was 2007 to 2014 BSD. The, the first comparison group was a general BSD population, ages 9 to 26, and when we used that comparison group, we used the max SPRT approach. We also wanted to look at and use a comparison group that were vaccinated, still historical, ages 9 to 26, only they were vaccinated with the uh, vaccines that are normally given or routinely given to adolescents. So that'd be Tdap, Td, meninge vaccines, uh, H Hep A, and varicella. 
When we use that particular um, control comparison group, we use the CMAX SPRT. CMAX is especially designed so that it accounts for the fact that we have smaller samples, smaller uh, sample sizes, and uh, that's because we're using the vaccinated group. We didn't do that. If we use the max SPRT, we'd have more issues with uh, inflated type one error rates. So then the other main one that we used is the exact sequential analyses. And this is more optimal for more common outcomes, but we did it for all of them. And in this case, the comparison group is a concurrent comparison group. So it's the same time period of 2015 to 17, still nine to 26, but also vaccinated again with those um, adolescent vaccines. So the follow-up of, of RCA signals, uh, once we see a signal, we, we obviously want to look for any sort of errors or patterns or unusual uh, anomalies in the data. Uh, we also typically will want to do a temporal scan on that analysis, looking for clustering within the risk window. And then we often will do medical record review to confirm the cases, especially if they're serious or uncommon. And then if we get to a point where we still have concern, we'll do additional epidemiology study such as um, a case control or one of the self-controlled um, methods. So on to the results. This first um, graph shows um, the cumulative count of the nine valent vaccinations in VSD. And the blue lines represent the age group of nine to 17. And the red lines rep represent the age group of 18 to 26. The smooth lines represent females and the lines with uh, diamonds on them represent males. So you can see, not surprisingly, that uh, the 9 to 17-year-olds have more vaccines, more vaccinations. And within that group, you see that the males actually have some, uh, slightly more vaccinations than females, whereas the opposite is true for the um, 18 to 26-year-olds. Next slide is um, same sort of legend, uh, only this time we're looking at weekly counts of the vaccinations uh, in the VSD. And um, you see again in the younger age group, the 9 to 17 year olds, a couple of prominent spikes. Those spikes occur right around August, so just before uh, they're going to school. And you don't see anything like that in the older age group. So now we're going to move on to the sequential analysis results and start with a summary of the max SPRT results. So for all the adverse events that were evaluated using the max SPRT, we didn't have any signals except for one, which is in males 18 to 26, and it was pancreatitis. A little bit more detail of this particular signal. It, there were a total of eight exposed cases of pancreatitis in this subgroup. The relative risk was 3.1, and the test statistic was 3.7, which was in excess of the critical value. The only thing that's really important to remember about that test statistic and its critical value is that once the test statistic exceeds the critical value, it's statistically significant. And in our case, it was at the 0 0.050. We also evaluated this um, outcome in the CMAX SPRT, in which case there was no signal. The relative risk was a fairly modest 1.8 and um, not statistically significant. And then we finally evaluated this outcome in the ESA, the exact sequential analysis, in which case the relative risk was uh, at 4.7, so it was elevated, but the p-value was 0 0.47. So not, again, not significant. We did um, medical record review for the pancreatitis cases and found that um, for six of the eight, the provider or the clinician determined that there was actually a cause uh, stated in the medical record that there was a cause for pancreatitis, those causes being alcohol, trauma, metastatic cancer, or it's possible that in one or two cases that they simply weren't pancreatitis. There was one case where it was a possible, determined to be a possible case, but the provider considered it more likely that the um, symptoms were related to reflux. So that left us one confirmed incident case without an alternative cause or explanation. So based on the fact that this medical record review showed that seven of the eight cases were unlikely to be related to the vaccine and the analyses that we discussed in the previous slide, no further investigation was uh, warranted after that. Oh, before I talk about the summary of the ESA, I don't have a slide for this, I should have, but for all the outcomes that we analyzed using the MAX-SPRT, we also analyzed using the CMAX-SPRT. 
and there were no signals uh, generated. So talking about the summary of the ESA results, um, again, most of the, the uh, adverse events that were evaluated with the ESA did not uh, generate a signal. We did see signals generated for syncope, injection site reactions, allergic reaction, and appendicitis. So this next slide shows more detail about those signals. And for the most part, we see fairly modest um, relative risks. Uh, the one sort of standout is injection site reaction, uh, males 18 to 26, dose three, where the relative risk is 95. But the data on this slide, I need to emphasize, comes from the very first signal that was generated. And in this case, for injection site reaction, males 18 to 26, following dose three, uh, that signal occurred in the very first week of surveillance. And it had only three cases total, two of which were exposed. So based on the fact that there were such a small number of cases that it occurred at the very first week, we thought the best course of action was to follow this outcome fairly closely over the next several weeks. Uh, when we did that, we determined, we found that the total number of cases increased, but the total number of exposed cases did not, at least not very much. And the relative risk dropped down to about two or three fairly quickly. We had a similar uh, phenomenon for the males 18 to 26, dose one. There were two other um, uh, adverse events to point out allergic reactions in two different settings, as well as appendicitis. And I'll talk about those in a little more detail. But before I do that, um, let me first just mention that in the case of uh, syncope and injection site reaction, both of these were expected based on clinical trials of the nine valent vaccine and clinical, clinical experience with the quadrivalent. So no formal studies, uh, follow-up studies were planned for those two. For the allergic reaction that occurred in females, uh, allergic reaction uh, that occurred in females nine to 17, and that was in the ED and inpatient setting, there were a total of 26 cases. Over two thirds of those cases though, turned out to be due or were something else. And most of them were injection site reaction or reaction to, uh, allergic reaction to food or drug. We had one or two that were also coding errors. We also looked at, uh, determined whether or not there was a signal in the outpatient setting for the same uh, subgroup, females nine to 17. And we did that because if there was in fact an association between the vaccine and allergic reactions, and we found it in ED and inpatient, it's not unreasonable to suspect that we would also find it, some evidence of it in the outpatient setting. Turned out there was no signal in the outpatient setting. The relative risk was 0 0.85 and the p-value was 0.75. So no association in that particular setting. So based on the medical record review, as well as these analyses, uh, we determined that no further investigation was warranted. Similarly, for the uh, allergic reaction that was in the outpatient setting, females 18 to 26 following dose two, most of those 15 cases were due to um, injection site reaction or some other uh, allergy. They were not actually uh, likely to be related to the um, HPV vaccine. And we also looked for a signal in the, in, in the ED and inpatient setting for that uh, particular subgroup uh, and found that the relative risk was um, 0 0.4, the p-value was 0 0.75. Again, no signal there. And so as before, we didn't uh, do further investigation after this. So finally, our last signal uh, is appendicitis, a little bit more interesting. There were 30 cases that were exposed to the nine valent vaccine. The, and this is in the ESA now. And the ESA results showed a, a relative risk of just over two with the p-value 0.03. We also did this analysis, or looked at this particular adverse event in the MAX SPRT and the CMAX SPRT. And uh, at the time of the ESA signal, and there was no uh, signal for the, either of those two methods, and in fact, during the entire surveillance period, there was no increased risk. The relative risk was 1.3 to 1.6, and it didn't approach um, statistical significance. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we do when we have a signal, one of the things we can do is do a, a temporal scan analysis looking for clustering over time. And uh, what you see here are the counts uh, this bar chart is accounts of the 
cases that occur over the 42 day period up by when they occur. And if you look at this visually, it doesn't, it doesn't look like there's any clustering. But the SATSCAN program that produces this also looks at various windows of various, wi of various widths and, and computes p-values to determine whether or not they are significant. So for all the windows that were computed, uh, the p-values range from 0 0.78 to 0 0.98. So clearly no evidence of temporal clustering for appendicitis following vaccination. We did chart review or medical record review for appendicitis. There were 30 cases that were exposed in all. All 30 had, uh, were confirmed. All 30 had appendectomies. Most of those were confirmed by pathology. So the next thing we did for appendicitis was to do a self-controlled risk interval analysis. The self-controlled risk interval analysis is one of those, um, is one of the self-controlled analyses like uh, self-controlled case series. In fact, it's a sort of derived from the self-controlled case series. And in, in this SCRI, you have uh, risk intervals and control intervals that are self-matched. So within an individual. So that sort of inherently controls for any sort of time-stable confounders. And the risk window that we use, obviously, is the 1 to 42 days. The main unexposed window that we used was the 43 to 84 days. We actually had 30 cases also in that 43 to 84 days. And those were all chart review as well. The results of the SCRI was um, a relative risk or an um, incident rate ratio of 1.4 with a 95% confidence interval of 0 0.77 to 2.62. So no evidence of a significant association there. So the strengths of this, of the RCA, nine valent RCA, is that we have near real-time access to electronic medical records. We also have, in VSD, the capacity to look at medical record review. And we had nearly 900,000 vaccinations documented. And we used a variety of analytic methods that are pretty much complementary. One of the limitations, though, when we're using near real-time data is that it can be unstable. And even though we had a built-in lag period, uh, there can still be some variation and some instability there. Um, with, a, with any observational study like this, there's also the possibility for miscoding or secular trends and secular trends in disease incidence. The seasonality is also a possibility, but we, we looked at that and found there was no evidence for that in our study. So to conclude, this particular RCA is signaled for several adverse events following the nine-valent vaccine. Uh, syncope and injection site reactions were expected, but we didn't follow those up. All the other signals were further investigated, and the signals for allergic reaction, pancreatitis, and appendicitis were not confirmed after further evaluation. So I mentioned that um, we're, we've completed our weekly surveillance for the nine-valent, but we are going to take advantage of what we've um, the infrastructure that we've developed and do periodic analyses to ensure continued safety, especially for some of the more serious and uncommon outcomes like anaphylaxis and TBS. We don't have a whole ton of observations or uh, events in those areas, and so with additional surveillance, we hopefully will have a more refined estimate of the risk or lack thereof. So I'd like to thank um, a bunch of people, but in particular, I'd like to thank Ned Lewis and Bruce Fireman. Uh, for all the work they've done on RCA, as well as uh, Eric Weintraub and Julianne G. Thank you very much. Um, so do we have questions now for Dr. Arana, Dr. Donahue? Yes, Ms. Pellegrini. I have just a very quick one for Dr. Arana. Um, if we could pull up his slide 10 quick, any chance, just because it's a grid. Um, there is a line on there that says onset interval for the reports range from zero to 751 days. Is that, thank you, the second one up from the bottom. Is that right, 751? Oh, uh, yes, the A range? The day range on, of onset interval, the second, second to last uh, row. Okay. Yes, that's, that's uh, the number. Sometimes we get reports in VERS with, uh, after several and uh, even years after vaccination, unfortunately. Okay, so someone said, this happened to me, and I think it was related to the vaccine, even though I got vaccinated two years ago. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Dr. Walter. 
Uh, yes, for both of you, actually. In the reports of syncope, were there any other known characteristics, like were these people that were getting other vaccines in addition to HPV? For the reports inverse, uh, we received thousands of reports with syncope. Uh, unfortunately, again, we don't get much information or detailed information in those reports. And uh, when we went through those where we get some, uh, we have seen that some of the patients received other adolescent vaccines at the same time. Yeah, we actually had, um, well, we had a couple thousand counts of syncope, but we didn't look at all of those. Uh, but I would guess that we, all, we, we do have the ability to, to look to determine if there are vaccines given in combination with the nine valent and what those vaccines are. We didn't follow, like I say, we didn't follow up on these, so we don't have exact. Dr. Bernstein. How is this data incorporated, if at all, in the vaccine information sheets? or statements, facts, and information? Uh, we work with our communication team and we try to keep this information as quickly as we can so we can provide some information in our website. And we have other teams also receiving uh, updated data in terms of VAERS reports. Yeah, I think he's asking about the VIS, which actually isn't Immunization Safety Office responsibility, it's Immunization Services Division. So is Melinda still sitting there? Melinda, do you want to wear your other hat and answer? Yeah, I mean, the vaccine information statements are updated periodically when there's important new information that, um, that needs to be included. Uh, I, I think it's CDC in conjunction with FDA. Isn't there also, a, there's a process where they're actually posted for public comment, so it's and, quite a rigorous process. Someone's in the back who I can't quite see. <laughs> Stan Grog, American oh, Osteopathic Association. Uh, just a comment, when <clears throat> we were involved with some of the early studies with the HPV vaccine, and nobody fainted. And uh, we couldn't, the importance of post-surveillance uh, is great because the protocol required that they lie down for 30 minutes after uh, receiving the vaccination. So just importance of the post-surveillance. Yeah, we didn't actually look at, um, we didn't actually do a systematic uh, or, or sampling of uh, syncope and look at charts, but we did a very informal one and a small one, so it's not reflective of much of anything, but of the 18 or so that we looked at, the large majority were not incident syncope, they were actually history of, and we had people come in um, because they had a syncope episode, and while they're in there, they got vaccinated. So. It looks like it looks like they were um, association, but that's the way it was. And, and it, it actually would be interesting to see what would happen if you did do a more systematic sample of it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Dr. Markowitz. Okay, good afternoon. The second half of the HPV session will be on uh, the issue of harmonization of the HPV vaccination age recommendations for females and males, and this is specifically the upper age recommendation. I'll be giving the background and considerations. So I'm gonna specifically be uh, reviewing first the current recommendation for HPV vaccination, which you heard before. A brief history of ACIP policy for vaccination of males, and then the ACIP workgroup considerations for harmonization of um, males and females. So these are our current recommendations, which you again heard in previous talks, a routine at age 11 or 12 for females and males. The series can be started beginning at age nine. And for persons who are not previously vaccinated, Vaccination is recommended for females through age 26, males through age 21, and males 20 through to 20, 26 may be vaccinated, and vaccination is also recommended 
for males 20 through 226 who are immunocompromised, including HIV, who are transgender or men who have sex with men. Um, these um, catch-up recommend recommendations don't affect the child and adolescent schedule, but this is how they're represented on the adult immunization schedule. You can see there's separate rows for females and males, and there's a separate column for 21 to for 19 to 21 year olds and 22 to 26 year olds. And of course, harmonization would simplify this particular schedule. And this is figure two of the adult schedule for adults 19 and older uh, by medical condition and other indications. Again, there's a female row and a male row. So now for a brief overview of the history of these policy changes. Uh, here, this shows uh, recommendations from the beginning of the program in 2006, when vaccination was recommended for females through 2016. And these changes were the result of additional vaccines being licensed, males being added to the program, and data su to support the two-dose schedule. And I will review the changes specifically that affect males in 2009, 2011, and in 2015. So first in 2009, at that time, FDA licensed quadrivalent vaccine for use in males 9 through 26 based on data from a clinical trial in males, and the endpoint was anagenital warts. And at that time, a trial was ongoing to evaluate efficacy against anal precancers. ACIP reviewed data at that time, including uh, data on epidemiology, sexual behavior, burden of disease, programmatic issues, and cost effectiveness, and they decided to wait until there was efficacy data against anal precancers in males before making a routine recommendation. There was also uncertainty at that time about impact and cost effectiveness. And so in 2009, ACIP uh, made a, uh, what was called a permissive recommendation that quadrivalent vaccine may be given to males nine through 26 years. Two things of note between 2009 and 2011. First, FDA added prevention of anal cancer in males, as well as females, as an indication. And this occurred after a review of results from a trial in males that were submitted as a supplementary biologics license application. And second, vaccination coverage in adolescent girls was increasing but slowly and continued to be low. And these data um, are from the National Immunization Survey in 2010 showing in red uh, coverage in females for at least one dose, which was 49%, and three doses, which was 32%. Now, several meetings during a several year period, ACIP reviewed cost effectiveness of including males in the routine program, and they looked at several different models. And in all models, male vaccination was less cost effective than female vaccination. And all of these models also showed that the cost per quality gained of including males depended on a variety of assumptions, including the health outcomes that were included and also female vaccination coverage. With increasing coverage in females, male vaccination became less cost effective due to herd protection from female vaccination. The committee also heard data on cost effectiveness of vaccination of men who have sex with men, and modeling found that vaccination of MSM was cost effective through age 26 years. This slide shows data from one of the models presented to ACIP in 2011, with cost per quality gained using coverage assumptions similar to what coverage was in 2010. And on the left are females, and on the right are males, and there are two sets of bars for each, one including all potential HPV associated outcomes, and the other only outcomes for which there is an FDA indication. And the different color bars show the cost per quality gained at different catch up age groups and illustrate the increase in cost per quality with increasing age at vaccination. And the yellow bars are the incremental cost per quality for vaccination of 22 to 26 year old males, and the higher cost per quality in this age group uh, impacted ACIP considerations for the upper age for males. ACIP deliberations and, and conclusions um, in 2011 were that quadrivalent vaccine is safe and effective in males, the burden of disease justified routine vaccination, and there would be likely benefit from protect protection against all HPV vaccine type attributable outcomes. Males as well as females should be protected for equity, and vaccination of adolescent males was cost-effective at current coverage in the United States. 
and that routine vaccination was the best way to reach MSM in men with this sexual